Okay, um, let's get started. I'm conscious of everybody's time. So welcome um, everybody and I hope that you are doing um, uh, well today. Today is obviously the 1st of October, which means that we're in the final quarter of this year, but also the start of Black History Month. And uh, this uh, uh, webinar um, feels like a really important webinar about becoming an anti-racist uh, um, organization. Um, in March, uh, MHFA England launched our My Whole Self campaign, which explores... Sorry, Amazon just delivered something embarrassing. Nobody else here. Um, to, to My Whole Self, uh, which explored the link between identity, inclusion, um, at work and mental health. Um, as part of that uh, campaign, um, we did a series of podcasts, um, which you can find, we'll put in, um, in the chat. Um, which included um, a number of people talking about race um, and identity. Um, obviously, through the summer, uh, the issue of race and racism and systemic racism has been um, a real focus, and I hope uh, we'll um, see um, significant change um, in the months uh, and years um, ahead. Um, at MHF, a England, we have committed to um, a program uh, of work um, and Last week, we published guidance, which uh, um, is around how do you support uh, people of colour uh, and black colleagues um, in the workplace. Um, the details um, of that are on the next uh, slide. Um, and uh, we believe that it's really, really important as we do uh, the work to, um, to, to become anti-racist organisations, to think about the well-being and mental health of, of, of colleagues um, who are perhaps living and experiencing racism on a day-by-day, week-by-week basis. So um, I've just realised I haven't introduced myself. Um, my name's Simon Blake, I'm the Chief Exec, and I'm very shortly going to hand over to Amma um, Afrifi Chi um, to curate and to lead you through uh, this session. She'll introduce the panel as well. But let me just talk to you about this webinar. Um, in this webinar, we'll discuss the growing understanding of systemic racism within the workplace, the four dimensions of racism and effects these have on people of colour and black people, how to review policies and protocols through an anti-racist lens, and our progress so far in our journey to become an anti-racist organisation. So um, please do um, download this uh, free uh, guidance. Um, and with that, I just say again, welcome. And I'm going to hand over to Amma, um, who will introduce the panellists and take you through um, this session. And thank you very much for being here today. Morning. Thank you so much, Simon. Morning, everyone. And thank you all for being here today. We're joined today by a wonderful panel with Pavita Cooper, Rafaela Ricardo and Sandra Kerr. I'm actually going to leave them to introduce themselves because I always feel like there's never justice done by the chair. Um, so when we kick off with our first question, I'll also ask, um, Sandra, I'll ask you first to introduce yourself after that. So as Simon said, today is just going to be a discussion around how to become an anti-racist organisation. We have a few questions for the panel and we will also open up to Q&A for the audience. Can I please ask the audience to please filter your questions into the Q&A function rather than the chat function, because that then helps us to actually see the questions a lot quicker. So without any further ado, can we please go to the next slide for our first question um, as we have only got an hour and an hour goes by really quickly. So the first question that I'd like to put to Sandra first is should who should be responsible for ensuring that race ethnicity is on the on, on the organization's agenda and if you would please start by introducing yourself and then answering the question that'd be great. Thank you very much Emma and I'm delighted to be here um, on this uh, call this afternoon. So um, my name is Sandra Kerr. I'm the Race Equality Director for Business in the Community. I've been campaigning on this issue for many years now. Um, and prior to that, worked with the government and worked on equality issues there, as well as kind of delivering of frontline services. So um, the question is, you know, who do I think should be responsible? I am absolutely going to say the top table. I think the chief exec, the executive sponsor, the group head of the HR and all the people around that top table um, are the ones that need to be responsible, not only to ensure that this is on the agenda, that it stays on the agenda, that it has data associated it 
to it to track and see if actions implemented um, are taken on board and actually having an effect and ensuring that there is accountability for um, change or no change in the organization. Um, that doesn't mean that managers at every level do not also need to be responsible. So I say those who um, manage people who have uh, diverse teams and just teams in general also have a responsibility. And ultimately, you know, as the, the, you know what we've seen in the recent um, months, everybody needs to have some responsibility. No one can just stand by and say, I don't care, because this is about inclusion. It's about all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. And I'd also want to add, ask that question up to you, Pavita, and also Rafaela. Um, please, again, introduce yourselves. But actually, let's, is there anything else you'd like to add? But I'd also like to focus more a bit more about what does that accountability and responsibility look like? Pavita. Thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to join you all today. Um, so I'm Pavita Cooper. Um, and I spent 25 years in a number of very large global organisations leading organisational effectiveness, which included DNI and talent and all those good things. And um, I, I now run an advisory organisation working with boards advising on talent and diversity. Um, but I'm also a commissioner for the Equality and Human Rights Commission, and I also chair the Chartered Management Institute Race Advisory Board. Um, I'd fully support what Sandra said that obviously, you know, you need this to start at the top. Um, but I think in my work, particularly what I've seen increasingly over the last few years is that unless leaders at every level, um, as, she, as she's already said, really take ownership for this, nothing changes. Because when you set targets at the top, a CEO or a chair or a board can only do so much. We know that the real shift in organisation happens from those everyday small actions, behaviours, nudges, um, the way in which decisions are made around everything from promotion, but equally how everyday work is assigned. So it's really critical that leaders at every level see themselves as responsible. Um, and in terms of accountability, um, you know, there's a range of ways to do that. I mean, obviously the most obvious way is to hardwire it into people's KPIs and deliverables and hold people to account for progress. Um, but I also think expectation setting. So um, recognizing leaders understanding that when we look at engagement for example one of the indicators that leaders will be measured on is their engagement scores which includes a sense of the degree to which they 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 create inclusive teams um, so it's not just the sort of the obvious output and results it's the soft stuff around behavior um, the engagement and the tone that they're setting as leaders thank you so much Pravita um, Raphaela anything else you want to add to that um, hi everyone, hello. Um, my name is Rafaela Ricardo and I am the Community Engagement Manager at MHFA England. Um, that means that my normal day-to-day -day job is bringing mental health literacy and skills to all kinds of communities across the country, in particular um, disadvantaged communities. And at the moment working with Simon and Emma um, to transform our organisation into an anti-racist one. So it's been really exciting, really happy to be here on this panel as well. Um, I don't really have anything to add. Um, uh, everything that Sandra and Pavita said, I completely agree with, starts at the top. Um, usually movements like this are more um, championed by junior members of teams in organisations, um, which is amazing and it's great, but I think that there is something um, to be said about having the backing of senior leadership team, as everybody has said. So, um, yeah. Just agree with 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 that um, that trickle down effect. Thank you, Rafaela. I actually just realised I didn't introduce myself because I was so excited to get started with this panel. So, um, but, um, Simon did introduce me earlier. But my name is Emma Fifuchi. I am head of culture and wellbeing at Mental Health First Aid England. But I also lead um, together with Simon and Rafaela our um, race equity work about becoming an anti-racist organization and also within um, our communities and our uh, instructor network. So yes, that, that is me. Um, and I actually definitely agree with and echo with everything that you've said. I think there's an important thing about having and setting the tone from the top because we do have leaders in our organization and we do look to our leaders to role model and set the agendas. But I also believe that, you know, whatever level you are, to your point, Sandra and Pavita, you are also leaders in your own right. So I think looking at how you're responsible to have make sure that the cultures you create are part, you are part of that. 
is very crucial, but I think the leadership should also make space to empower their employees to do so. So if we can go to the second question, please. So question number two, what is the best way to address the reluctance and discomfort to talk about race and equity at work? And can I start with you, Pavita, first with this question? Sure. Um, someone in the audience has just said that they're struggling to hear me, so I've turned my volume up and I'm going to speak more loudly. So hopefully that will help. I hope that you can all hear me now. Um, I mean, I think this question has to be addressed in two ways. I, mean, I think it depends who we are directing this question at. If we're talking about people of colour inside the organisation versus um, leaders or others, discomfort can sit at two levels. So in my experience, when uh, leaders and other people in the organisation are reluctant to talk about race, and we, we do see a, a wide silence around the issue of race, generally in UK society and also in organisations, it's often because people feel inequipped to have the conversation in a way that feels appropriate and sensitive. Um, I think, you know, on the back of many, many years of unconscious bias training and a sense of not being out of step and saying the wrong thing, many leaders say to me, I don't feel equipped to say something where I might inadvertently offend someone or I might say the wrong thing. And in, in, in my defense, what then happens is I say nothing, which isn't helpful. So I think from that perspective, it's really important we help equip leaders to feel that they can have um, an empathetic and sympathetic conversation about race. For people of color, I think it's essential that we create um, environments which are psychologically safe for them to be able to talk about their experiences and they can do that in a way whether uh, the contribution they make is um, on anonymous if necessary, that it's uh, unattributed, um, that they are not exposed in any way and also they're not feel that they have to shoulder the emotional labour of being able to talk about what's really happening happening in their organization and wider society. Um, so I, I think it's, the response is different for different groups. Thank you, Pavita. Rafaela, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I am. Um, I agree with everything Pavita said. Um, I think if I was just going to add something, it would be around um, around language. So, um, you know, talking about the reluctance and the discomfort about race inequality, that really comes down to the discomfort about um, about racism itself and all the ways that it manifests. And I think that maybe sometimes people feel reluctant to talk about it because, well, as Pavita mentioned, something around um, offending people. It's not being equipped with the right language. It's not, um, you know, seeing across the internet, there are lots of, um, lots of sources of information, you know, which is people's opinions, which is discussions that people have had. And it's hard to almost pinpoint the, the right thing to say because everybody has got something that they identify with, like a different thing that they identify with. So there's almost like something around providing um, staff with um, like a language guide or a definitions guide, something that makes them feel comfortable to, to have these conversations probably for the first time. Um, I guess people of colour, black colleagues, they might not talk about race at work, but might be more likely to talk about it with in, in safe spaces, in friendship circles, with family, etc. So the conversation is a lot... Um, it just feels more comfortable, it feels more familiar. But I think that sometimes people um, people feel like a, a level of fear because, um, because it, it's, it's just something that they're doing for the very first time. And with the current climate at the time, at right now, it feels like with cancel culture and people accidentally saying things that they didn't mean, you know, knowing that they're going to be dismissed from now on, um, some rightly so, some unfairly, but um, I think that there's like a level of fear. So um, helping people with language and learning how to, how to talk about these things could also be helpful. Thanks, Ra. And Sandra, so yes, what is, a, a bit, talk a bit more about this reluctance and discomfort and how, how do we equip people to have or best address this in the workplace? <laughs> You're on mute, Sandra. Uh -huh, yes, the first thing to realize is that everybody, there is a level of discomfort probably across all of the population. When we did our race at work survey, only 38% of people said that they felt their employer were com comfortable and that didn't matter what ethnicity group. So just first of all, acknowledge it's, you know, there's levels of discomfort from all uh, ethnicity groups. I think the other thing that I was, you know, thinking about, so with as tragic as the King of George Floyd and, you know, the ones that died before him, Brandon Bro Taylor and all the others whose names aren't mentioned, what it has done actually is redeem the word black. I mean, you know, hello, it, it dropped off the, 
kind of almost the we're not allowed to say it and people felt insensitive about it and when I wrote a little booklet let's talk about race in 2017 you know one of the things is am I allowed to say black I put it in there because I'm like please and now what it's done we're able to now use that terminology and everybody knows what we're talking about rather than pretending that we don't know what we're talking about I think the element of everybody just needs to get past that and not get stuck there because otherwise if you continue to stay in that space how on earth can you seek to tackle the things but a couple of things i've written down as far as kind of practical things i think to get past this we are big you know i'm a big advocate of reverse mentoring two-way mentoring getting to connect with people talk to people hearing lived experience building rapport then you can you know talk to them about what their lived experience now we just add you know don't come to the conversation skeptical because you may hear some things that you think oh get out because they're outside of your lived experience but you need to kind of just open up and listen and you know one of our you know bits of guidance is don't judge because you might hear things and you think oh i can't believe it but actually it's the lived experience. And then the other thing that I wrote down is really about employee surveys. So surface your employee surveys and look at the comments, look at what people have said. And what I've seen uh, happening now really across some kind of executive teams that the senior executives have to read out some of those comments to really help them connect and realize, oh my goodness, this is what's going on here. What are we going to do about it? So I think you know, those are a couple of, a couple of things that you know practical things that could be done to help to move away from the, the place of you know being stuck really because you are um, uncomfortable and actually people always prefer if you ask you know so this fear about terminology you can just say oh you know i've read the booklet and they said this what do you think and most people will be glad that you asked rather than trying to make stuff up so you know one hundred percent sandra and i and i do think that there's an element around Oh, I don't want to talk about it. And yes, there is that whole fear factor, but I think it's rising above the fear and rising above the discom being, feeling discomfortable. Because in order to be comfortable, you have to deal with what you're uncomfortable about. And once you've dealt with it and you continue to embrace it and continue to continue to understand it, you become less comfortable. So I think it is, I agree with you. I think it's actually acknowledging the fact that you're about to jump into something that you're not comfortable with but you're going to have to do it for the bigger and the greater good of what you're mm -hmm. trying to achieve and I also agree about asking someone you just ask just you know if you, people will let you know what they prefer to be called or prefer to be identified as if you just ask the question I think the caveat being is and I was reading the other day about compassionate um, curiosity because I think there's an element of understanding that whilst you want to ask the questions you ask it in a compassionate way and lead with empathy in that to embrace the vulnerability of what's about to happen in the conversation and I think that is quite crucial to people being open enough to want to ex express or share their experiences with you determining on how you approach that so I do agree with all, all that you have said all three of you but I also think that having that lens of empathy and compassion also leads to a greater opening up of conversation and I think also once somebody has opened up to your point Sandra if we are doing surveys in an organization the fact of the matter is if you are seeking information you don't have to do something with the information that you seek there is no point in seeking that information and then letting it go into a hole that nobody actually addresses anymore the impact thereafter is actually worse off than actually not asking in the first place so i think there is definitely something in accountability of once you seek that information you are seeking it to make change and a good change at that so if you can go to the next question please um, which i think connects in some of the stuff we were saying in the previous question but so if someone experiences and or reports racism how should a manager respond or um, a person that is a leader of people and Raphael, i want to go to this question with you first um okay um i think that well this is a really good question i think that not enough managers know how to uh, respond to someone reporting racism or experiences of racism. Um, but I think one of the most important things is about validating the experience. So um, there are a number of ways that managers can do this, but I think one of the things that they could do in the first instance, so when first, someone first comes and talks to you, discloses something, it's about showing or demonstrating genuine concern and genuine interest in the story, really, really listening. So that means like, you know, employing all the listening skills we've been learning since we were young, things like eye contact, things like putting away the work that you're doing in that moment and focusing on the person. Um, 
I think that there's something around if you if you are in the middle of something and one of your staff just does disclose something or does tell you that something has happened um, but you don't have the time to discuss it now I think schedule time schedule time to get it in explain to them that you really you really want to know about their experience you really want to hear about it and um, you want to give them that your undivided attention so schedule time if you don't have time in that moment um, I also think that there's something about um, so validating the feelings, so letting them know that you understand why they feel that way. Um, oftentimes when people experience racism, especially in the workplace, it can be really humiliating, um, as well as obviously painful and quite scary really, especially if you feel like no one um, beside you has, um, has stepped in for you or has defended you in any way. So I think that letting your staff member know that um, you understand why they would feel that way is, is really important. Um, I also think that managers need to understand how risky it is, how risky it feels to come forward to a manager, especially if the manager is not black or a person of colour, if they're a white manager and you're, you are a person of colour yourself, I think it can feel really scary just in, you know, the fear that they may not understand. So I think acknowledging like something to do with that, the braveness maybe or the courage or something um, and um, making, the, making your staff member just feel safe letting them know that this won't go un unnoticed it won't go um it won't be ignored um and what i was just going to also add one thing that sometimes managers do in, in this instance but in lots of in other instances is ask put it back onto the staff member so ask the staff member okay wh what would you like me to do and i think that is a good tactic it's a good managerial tactic but i don't think that it's very helpful in that first conversation. So in that first instance, I think what the person is looking for is for like to be heard, to feel understood and to feel validated. And I think asking the staff member in that moment how, how they would like, um, what they would like the manager to do, I think it um, can provide like a sense of uneasiness and like distrust in your manager. You might think that they don't know what they, you know, they don't know how to handle the situation and it could create more fear. Um, so I think that there's something about if, if it is if it is the case that the manager might not know the exact next steps to take in that moment it's about reassuring them that they are going to do something they're going to go away and think about what the best course of action is and in that time you know whether that's getting advice from the HR team or doing your own research reading things online how to support that kind of situation and then maybe when you meet again present like a list of options of things that the manager could do to fight the corner and then then maybe ask the staff member of you know these are some of the things that i could do to support you is there anything here that you think could be useful i think that could also be helpful but um just you know just a couple of suggestions no thank you Raph. and i think there's some key things that you said in there around feeling heard feeling validated and understood um sandra if i can come to you on that and just again if there's anything you want to elaborate on from what rapper said is how should managers because there is something very crucial i think something that rapper mentioned is very much around being there for that individual and not putting it back onto that individual to offer solutions so i'd love to get your take on what you think with um in, in, in respect to this question sandra you're on mute again <laughs> I'm good to be the naughty person aren't I, throughout this session, keep talking on mute. Um, as Raphael was speaking, I was just thinking through, um, I think, you know, she's absolutely right as a manager and the leader. The first thing is to listen without judgment. You take note, you listen. It's not trying to argue with the person and say, are you sure? Do not be skeptical and say, oh, are you sure? You know, what's happened? I think it also depends on what you're told, because actually if it's a crime, you know, it's a case of this is outrageous and I need to escalate I cannot wait on this one because it's just at risk person's lives at risk or their health at risk or whatever so I think depending on what you hear depends on what you're going to do um, but I think the principle of actually thinking through and I think this is part of ensuring that you do have transparent processes so that if it is first of all if it is something that we can mediate we can have a conversation potentially get two people together and you know and I say if you can get that done quickly so it's not about rushing the person you know to say right let's get together let's get you in the room and knock your heads together I'm not talking about like that but actually while everyone can remember so hopefully you'll be you know technically because again you need to create the environment where people feel like they can speak up so that you get something you get some uh, somebody talking to you early on 
where we don't have people with amnesia and can't remember what was said. So that's the power of getting it done as quickly as possible, where everybody can remember what's said, and it's not this, oh, I don't remember saying it, yes, we do, because it only happened yesterday, or whatever. So try and looking to do that as quickly as possible, so that we can, where if, because invariably, sometimes people have said things or behave in a way and are appalled when confronted with that, gives them a chance to say, you know, this is, you know, I'm sorry, and I, you know, I, you know, let's talk about what I can do to kind of, you know, what does God look like, or, you know, that kind of mediation, I think, would always be what the aim would be um, because it is exhausting and it is traumatic to have to go through formal procedures and you know people often think oh you know people complain but I'm telling you you know what I say that the, the, the thing under the current here with ethnicity is who was at the table when your parents were selected when your um, ethnicity this is what it is and if you feel that you are being treated unjustly because people are looking at the colour of your skin or, you know, just who you are or they don't understand, it's, you feel trapped. I mean, how do you, you know, I'm not going to change overnight, am I? I'm still going to be me. So that's why this is such a sensitive topic and people should, wherever possible, if you can get to um, conversation and resolve things um, through uh, medium mediation or just conversation, you should do so. Um, but I also think um, what the manager mustn't do is do nothing at all so just say yes and then just under the carpet it does need to um, be resolved and eventually you know the, the individual will have to be asked you know what you know just and sometimes you can as you talk through and you know if you're doing all the active listening that Rafaela says you'll actually be picking up on cues on things that can be done that where there's been a shortfall where there's a lack of understanding to try and bring um, heads together because what we're trying to do if we're all working together if we're all in the same team we're trying to deal with this and move forward to a, a, a potentially you know better collaborative future together and it's a chance to just get everything out in the open in a safe space and not feel like there's going to be some backlash or um for speaking up because you know if you do that that will just send ripples through the organization then everyone might not come and tell you that they know but it will spread like wildfire that oh don't trust them and that they don't mean what they say so really important um that 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 is not the case and there is no kind of hidden backlash for speaking up thank you so much sandra and favita is there anything else you wanted to add just want to add um two brief points because I think um, the others have spoken eloquently about the, the challenges of these very sensitive things when they come up. The first is the definition of racism and in my experience where organizations get tripped up is if someone brings forward an issue, if someone's brave or courageous enough as Rafaela said to even come forward and state something's wrong, um, sometimes what can happen is line managers can discount what they perceive as racism so they might brush it away as banter or well I think your colleague was just joking or you're being a bit oversensitive um, I run a lot of listening groups and organizations and that's one of the things I hear most from colleagues in the groups I'll say um, my, when I challenge people even my own peers they'll just say well you're being oversensitive and managers say the same thing um, the only way to get around this is to have a zero tolerance policy so the CEOs I work with I encourage them to stand up and say we have zero tolerance there there is no joking, there is no laughing about this, there is no um, you know, using slang words for certain races or things that you think are acceptable. What you might say in the pub with your friends is not acceptable here. Um, and if people say silent, it doesn't mean it's okay. So I think that's really essential. Otherwise, I think there are blurred lines um, around what people perceive as genuine racism. The second thing is in terms of how a manager should respond. Any manager should be asking themselves, if this has happened on my watch, if this has happened in my area, in my uh, realm of control, what is it I have done to set a tone or an environment that leaves people thinking that it's okay to behave in this way, to either make pejorative comments to someone else based on their race, um, or to joke about something totally inappropriate. And you could argue the same thing for, if it was with a woman um, around sexism or any other form of discrimination against any other protected characteristic, what is it I'm telling people, the signals I'm giving that make people think that here today on my watch, that's okay. So I think the first thing a manager has to do is ask himself that question and then think about um, their own behavior and the climate that they're setting. 
Thank you so much, Pravita, and thank you all of you. I think there's this there's some really great messaging coming through there about, and I love that point that you make, Pavita, about a manager looking at themselves, because I think when it comes to racism, but not just even racism, we talk about intersectionality and inclusion, we have to look at it from a self perspective. You have to be more self aware and look at yourself inward and truly ask yourself the questions and the uncomfortable questions you're not willing to face. You know, when we talk about white privilege, white fragility, whatever it is, you need to ask yourself the right questions about you because it is true. If you are a manager and people are expecting you to lead, what environments are you creating for people's behavior and what in behaviors are you endorsing um, by not actually dealing with it? I think the interesting thing about zero tolerance. Pavita, sometimes when we often mention that word, it becomes very much a punitive, we must discipline. But I also agree with you, I think that it's very much a case of, un of companies and organisations understanding that whether it's zero tolerance for racism, whether it's to do with bullying or harassment, at the end of the day, what you actually are saying is that we are not tolerating certain behaviours in our culture and our workplace. And also we're going to be leading by example that this is not going to be right. I think there's an obviously a difference between having a conversation about a situation versus actually dealing with something that is actually quite derogatory or not. So, you know, I think it's just a really interesting concept when we talk about zero tolerance and actually when we talk about behaviours, because a lot of times when we talk about racism or anything to do with intersectionality or inclusion, suddenly people start thinking about, OK, well, we need to implement these things and these policies and these reviews, which we ultimately need to do. But nobody really wants to address the behaviours, which is fundamentally the hardest things to change, but bring about the most change in organisations if done properly and done right. Um, conscious of the time and we are at our final question before we go into Q&A. So for our last question, which I will open up to um, all our panelists, so whoever wants to go first, please, please feel free, is we know that allyship is about doing. So what does good allyship look like? And who would like to go first and answering that question? I'm happy to jump in. So if you Thanks, Rebecca. I know Raffaella and Sandra will have uh, lots of good things to say, so I'll just mention a couple of things. I mean, I think this has become a very in vogue word, the notion and concept of allyship, particularly over recent months. And it's something in most organizations I work with are talking about a lot. Um, I, th I think it's uh, complex because you can look at collective allyship, i.e. the organization leaning in and thinking about how they as a body, as an organization, as a leadership cohort, think about their role and how they engage and support um, the Bain community in their business. But I think my perspective on this is it's very individual. This is about every leader and every single individual. And it's not just about management, it's about every colleague thinking about how do I extend my, my personal agency to those that don't have um, the same opportunities as I do. It's about the leveling up agenda. It's about leveling the playing field. So if you're someone who by, by the nature of the fact that maybe you're um, a male graduate who's had more opportunities and therefore you're further ahead, looking behind you and thinking, what would it take to level this playing field? What do I have to do? So just a couple of examples at a more senior leadership level, the work that looks like is thinking about if you're going to convene a group of people together, whether it's a senior leadership forum in the days when we eventually do that, even if it's virtual, looking around and saying, does this room look representative of both the organization which we work in and the communities which we support and the society in which we live in? If it doesn't, what do I need to do to bring other people into this room? At an individual level, it looks like ind individuals looking at themselves and thinking, to be a better ally to those colleagues around me, how do I better understand their lived experience, as Sandra talked about earlier? One way is to talk about to the individuals about what their life is like and what it's been like for them both in outside of work but also to question for yourself at a very very personal level how is it that um, i live my life in a way that means i don't understand those experiences is it because when i look around me at my immediate group of friends and people i socialize with and where i live i'm in a small community where everyone looks just like me what is it I need to do to be curious and open that up and think about how I might broaden my world so that I can better understand the experience of others? Um, and this is what June Sapong and her book calls about check your circle. Um, you know, so if you're living a life outside of work that is mirrored very much in work, but everyone looks the same, then you've got no way of being able to be a good ally. And being a good ally starts being able to understand the experience of others. Thank you so much, Ravita. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I totally and 100% echo everything you're saying. Um, Rafaela, Sandra, do you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to speak to that. So um, I recently uh, released the Race at Work Black Voices report, and this was unpublished data around what did black employees respond to the Race at Work survey, which we ran in 2018. And this was very much in response to employers asking for support and I suppose I confess to putting out a blog post within a few days of uh, George Floyd uh, dying to say, look, what I think the three things I think employers need to, to focus on is leadership and ensuring that voice around the top table, particularly when decisions are being made that are going to affect black people. The second one was allyship because what was great to see was white people as well as black people outside peacefully saying, look, you know, we can't have this, we need a better society. And then the third area was engaging with employers and um, employees listening and then also c communities. But also what we found from the inside was when we asked about um, can you be yourself, only 66% of black employees said this compared to 71% of white mixed ethnicity Asian employees. So this thing around actually feeling like I can be myself. So that's why this campaign about being yourself is really interesting. Um, and that's the role of inclusive leaders. But also one of the other questions that we asked about was um, attribution. So, you know, do you get credit for your ideas? Only 49% of black people said yes in the workplace compared to 57% of all kind of other people in the workplace, all the other ethnicities. So there is something there around how can you be a good ally? Making sure that attribution, so ideas, things that have been generated, um, are attributed to the right person, that in meetings as a leader, people are not talked over, um, and that actually if they make a point and you see that it's just been dismissed, you can stand by and say, hold on a minute, don't you think we should explore that a bit more? So just actually active, and I, you know, in the report I talked about active listening and it was a senior, one of the senior uh, government officials at an event recently who said actually we need active uh, not only listening, but seeing and feeling. So that element of being active, looking you know, around, being alert, and not overlooking things when you, in the past, maybe you did do your thing, I can see it, but you just, to stay in the in-group, to stay safe, you, you let it go ahead. Um, and also, one of the really interesting um, data points that we found in the research, when we asked people about, do you see ethnicity as a no, what do you think would be a blocker to your next move, move career move? It was a multiple cho choice question. 33% of black people said that ethnicity would be in the way. 1% of white people said that. And I think it was 13% of the Asian ethnicity group. But when you think about 33% versus 1%, you realize the lived experience is so different. So this is almost the precursor and a warning that being an ally is not always going to feel comfortable and sometimes may feel strange because what creates a lived experience where people are certain that this is going to be in the way compared to uh, what are you talking about? Why would ethnicity be a thing? So when you think about that conversation, this is back to that not judging or assuming the person is, you know, a bit left field or off because you don't understand, but it's actually that really active listening and getting informed. So a good ally seeks to get informed um, and doesn't necessarily, it's not about bullying person saying, right, I'm going to stand by you whether you want me or not, but it's about, again, being sensitive to that as well, but um, where you can uh, use that opportunity. And also, I think a good ally is somebody who not always, you don't have to do everything when you've got an audience. You may be in the mm -hmm. meeting, everyone is white, and you say, hold on a minute, we're dealing with a huge policy that's going to affect a real diverse community. Where are the black voices around here and what we're going to do about it? So you'll be a more effective ally for what you do when you're not seen, because again, there's this, I'm really great ally and help them help. here's me saying how wonderful things are, opposed to the one that checks in because they can, you know, it's just a call, nobody's there to, to witness it, but they're checking in anyway and saying, how are you doing, you know? 100%, like, I, definitely, I definitely agree that it's allyship is not just on the screen, it's behind the scenes. And also being a good ally is 24 seven, 365 days a year. It's not when you pick and choose when you want to dip in and out of it. Um, I truly believe that, and I'm just conscious of time, and like I do want you to add to this before we go into our Q&A, but I do truly believe that allyship is also about empowerment. So creating the spaces and creating the, the opportunity for 
people of colour and black people to speak for themselves, but also having their back and speaking on their behalf when it's needed to. So I think there's some great, definitely great um, points that you both, Pavita and Sandra, have said. And Raph, do you um, want to add anything else to that before we go to Q&A? Uh, I just I didn't hear the end. Were you saying to it? No, I said, do you want to add to the question? Yeah, did you want oh, to right, add yeah. to the question? Um, I don't have much to add. I agree. Everything that Pavita and Sandra have said is exactly correct. Um, definitely agree about allyship and um, in terms of it not having to be a performance and not have to be like a circus act in front of everybody. Um, there's something really beautiful about like checking in when no one's listening and things like that. Like you said, I'm a 365 days a week. And I just also wanted to agree with the point that um, you both mentioned about um, getting informed, you know, trying to understand the experience of others. Um, I think it was Pavita that mentioned this earlier, which was talking about um, understanding the actual definition of racism. So um, obviously the, the mainstream definition of racism that people know or people call racism is, you know, saying horrible names, saying like racial slurs, being specific about like skin colour or whatever it might be. But obviously we know that racism works in lots of different dimensions, right? Sometimes the, the, the unseen ways or the behind the scenes, you know, the systemic kind of forms of racism are, um, can often be more detrimental to people, um, in particular with that, you know, when it comes to mental health and stuff. So I think um, being a good ally is also about understanding how all of those dimensions work. And um, Again, coming back to the point about validating, you know, if someone ex says something to you that maybe in your perception you might not deem offensive or racist, um, there is something about setting aside your own frame of reference and really listening to that person and understanding how it fits into a much wider um, construct. And um, so, yeah, something about, you know, educating yourself, basically. Yeah, no, and these are all valid points and which points we've actually referred to in our supporting um, people of colour and black people guide that we launched last week, which thankfully we had both Sandra and also Peter CMI be part of. Um, and these are very much points that we've raised in today's discussion that we've covered in the guidance, but also in, in your report that you mentioned, Sandra, um, for the race, the race to um, race to work for with black voices. Um, and there's some fundamental, really not shocking, but really unsurprising facts that were raised in those reports um, that really actually talk to and speak to what allyship looks like but also leadership as well so I'm conscious that we have like 15 minutes left and we've got a whole host of questions I just want to apologize in advance actually that we might not get through all your questions but we'll think of a way to actually answer them but um, if I can go to our first question which looks at um, which asks the question around, how do you start the journey to becoming actively anti-racist without in-house resources? Who would like to answer that question? I mean, I can start. I mean, we, one of the things we have put together and there is, it's on, online, um, how to be kind of anti-racist ally or whatever. So it's just a start. It's a fact sheet with some kind of insight and some reading that you can do to kind of get informed um as as a start and to be honest there, there and 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 we've done it we, we've put together some of the key government reviews which got some of the statistics um it also has some short films um and kind of a, you know for people to kind of watch to get some insight and then as i say i think if you can connect through reverse mentoring or just start to talk to somebody you know ask just say look i've read this stuff that really appreciate you know what your thoughts are these are mine so not a brain picking session because most people are like no 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 don't ask me so it's not like what do you think i should do um uh, on this it's about a genuine at least come to the table with some evidence of things that you've read and maybe to sense check that there's nothing wrong with that but opposed to oh that sounds really good. what do you think i should do you know that um is not you know right now people just feel like no and that, i just want to enforce reinforce that leaders need to lead and come up with the plan and the strategy and at least what they're thinking and then they can ask people does this sound right because um as uh, i think emma set out at the beginning this whole season this whole issue is hugely um traumatic for some people and, and I, I i will say again i know somebody who's lost 14 people with this pandemic there are people in your workforces in your circle that you won't know who are having a really tough time 
with this and have had a lot of tough times. So that sensitivity is really, really um, important. Thank you, Sandra. Um, Vivita, Raphael, do you want to add to that? I could ask the next question. <laughs> I think in the interest of time, we should probably just move on so we can get through some questions. Okay. Uh, Sandra, Sandra's uh, right that the uh, business and community have some really good resources. Perfect. And actually, there's been quite a few questions around um, board. So actually, it's um, how do you convince the top team or the board who um, in general are white centric and are reluctant to treat this as a measure it deserves? So, yes, how do you how do you engage with the board when they are predominantly white in this discussion? So th this is what I do every single day. <laughs> um, it's probably the most common thing I have to deal with. Um, and, and of course, uh, to a degree, we had the same issue on gender 10 years ago. Um, you know, no, there's not a problem. It's fine. I'm really committed. I'm not racist. We don't have a problem here. And I, I think you, the only way you can get a board to connect this issue is at a very human and very emotional level. Uh, people always say that boards, because they're predominantly dominated by a certain type of individual in terms of personality, preference and type, you need lots of data, lots of analysis. Clearly, that's one element that you do need to bring um, in your conversation. But I, I have never won this argument on anything other than a very emotive, very personal, very real, authentic stories about individuals in that organisation. And I think without that, you don't ever move the dialogue forward because all the time that they can see it as something abstract, other other than them something that happens to people outside in another organization somewhere else they'll never personally connect with it um, I remember 10 years ago when we were doing this stuff on gender it was often when boards and CEOs were for the first time having to face into the experiences of their daughters their goddaughters their nieces about what it was going to be like entering the workplace that suddenly they understood what the challenges really were it's harder to do that if you're not someone who has someone very close to you from a BAME background um, and it's even harder to do if you have no understanding of the experience of those individuals so I think uh, sharing some very very um, honest and sometimes quite difficult to confront truths is the way I do it and I find that's the only way that you move an organization forward thank you Pravita um I'm going to go to another question because, yes, we are conscious of time. So I've got one here that says, what can you do to keep colleagues feeling, to, to keep colleagues feeling supported when you as a manager don't necessarily believe in it, but don't have the power in the organization to change anything? Who would like to answer the question? Can I just double check? They don't, you don't believe in it. What does that mean? Don't believe in... So I will read the whole question in its entirety. As a mid-level manager, what if you personally don't want to see racism in the workplace go unnoticed, but you're fully aware that the senior team who are all white aren't equipped to deal with this, leading it, um, leading it to being brushed aside or brushed away? What can we do to keep our colleagues feeling supported when you as a manager don't necessarily believe in it, don't have the power or don't have that power in the organization to change it? Who would like to answer this question? I'll come in. Um, so I think you always have power. So you have power to have conversations, you have power, you know, you start that, those conversations. Um, it's very rare that you'll have a board where they're all um, 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 not sympathetic. You just need to find the one that is and what issue. So it may not be ethnicity, the leaders talked about it could be gender, could be disability. You know, sometimes people have got children who are disabled, you know, you find that, uh, that issue. But because, and, and also, as I say, this is the power of the evidence. So for example, every organization does employee surveys. At that time, you ask, can we be more transparent, please? Can we have a look? Can we look at the comments? Can we look at the issue by diversity, ethnicity group or diversity group? Can we convene some workshops? Can we, can, um, some focus groups to talk about what those issues are? Because people tend to not be able to argue with the numbers and the data for starters, then you overlay the stories. So the power sometimes of the data is it takes it out of the emotional box. So I do get mm -hmm. these part, but actually sometimes to get attention, sometimes they need to look up what's these disparities in these numbers, whatever they are, to start the conversation to even want to engage. Um, and I just wanted to add something to what um, Pavita said this morning. I know that there's a soft launch to the CBI's uh, change the race ratio campaign where they are actually really talking to FTSE organizations at the start to 
engage with the Parker Review to change the diversity of boards. And I know for a fact I saw a document from Legal in General that they say they're going to vote against chairs who do not implement action. So I think you need, yes, some stories to touch the heartstrings, but sometimes you need, there's going to be ramifications. If you don't, you might not have a job. So you need a mixture of both, I think, to wake people up to say, maybe I might want to look at it, you know, and it will help to concentrate minds because people are moved by all different bits. I agree. And I think also for those organisations that say that they don't have any surveys, just because you don't have any surveys doesn't mean you can't go out and have these safe conversations, safe group, focus group conversations around that. So, you know, I think just because you don't have the tools, you don't, doesn't give you the opportunity to create the tools. So I think it is a very much, rather than having the excuse of, well, we don't do surveys, it's actually thinking about, well, actually, how do we get people in a room to talk about their lived experience and to share that and actually offer the psychological safety that is needed to have real candid conversations about those experiences. And that's what you need to do in order to find out what you then need to change. Um, very conscious of time, we've got some really great questions. So I'm just gonna ask two more and then we're going to come to a close. The first one was around, um, Going back to the point made about zero tolerance environment, given that HR processes, et cetera, are meant to be confidential and therefore the racist comments behavior may not be widely known. Is there a need to name and shame? Question mark. Can we demonstrate a zero tolerance workplace if no one knows these discussions are happening? I'm, I'm happy to come in on that. I mean, I think um, no one wins an argument or a movement by shaming anyone. Uh, no, no, pro, no success was ever made that way. And that's not what this is about. And I think it's also important to balance this to say that in my experience, often when people have said something, it genuinely is inadvertently. They've used um, what we might consider to be a racial slur. I mean, it's happened in my own lifetime. It happens now. I go to dinner parties and I'm Indian and people say things and then they look at me and they'll say, but of course we don't mean you, Pavita, because you're just like us. And I'm like, well, no, I'm not, because my parents came here in the 60s. They were immigrants. They came with 10 pounds. It was tough. I had racist slurs shouted at me in the street. So when you use that word, it takes me back to that point. So I will get up and walk out if that happens. But not everyone has that power. Um, so if someone has genuinely said something inadvertently, that's about education. If someone has said something to discriminate or be hurtful, then that's not acceptable. And they should be dealt with through the company processes. There is nothing, however, more powerful than a CEO standing up and saying in this organization we have one rule and that is we treat each other with respect we have a zero tolerance policy if we find out that someone has acted in a way that was against our values and the ethics of this business you will not you will not not be here the next day and i see many organizations act out in that way all the time um, but i think that's possible to do that without calling out individuals in a way that's public and humiliating Absolutely. And I also think that the individuals that report it to HR are doing it in privacy. So they would want something to, to happen, even though they've been have even though they have been privy to it and exposed it in a, in a wider context. And it comes back to the point around when we use the words calling out and zero tolerance, there's definitely ways you can actually say it through whether it's, you know, important messaging in your um, your staff meetings in the way that you talk about uh, and embed behaviors within your organization and re-emphasize stuff to do with culture and values um, so I agree I think you know calling out somebody and having a hall of sh a wall of shame is not necessarily the outcome you want to happen but the actual fundamental point around the zero tolerance piece is that when so when something is said that something is done about it in some shape or form we are can I just can I jump yeah, in here? Just please jump in. So, I mean, one of the the commitments. So, one of the things we have uh, found, we have a race at work charter, and it is rising as far as employers signing up to it. The commitments, the leadership data, zero tolerance on bullying, harassment, managers engaged in progression of talent, and I think sometimes just them people knowing that the the leadership team, the boards of this organisation are interested. We are going to be reviewing the data on complaints. We're going to see where they come from. We're going to see who they are particip who's participating in such behaviour can act as a deterrent and make people be a bit more thoughtful. And that's what we need because what we prefer is people not to have to complain at all because people just be a bit more, I want to be, I don't want to be the manager who's named to the top table for the wrong reasons. So I think that deterrent will help many who maybe would be potential offenders not to be. Absolutely, and I think the key thing to this is around changing behaviours, right? So it takes time sometimes, but also it's very much something that needs to be embedded from a mindset perspective. Um, 
we are at time. Um, I would love to thank um, our guests, but if we can go to the next slide quickly, just to make sure I haven't missed out on anything. Um, Yes, we have some useful links and resources. I knew there was something coming up next. Um, so all the conversations we've had today in terms of our points and um, uh, discussions, you can also find some really great useful resources and links on, uh, on the BITC website where we talked about the report and some of the things that Sandra's mentioned, the race uh, work charter. We also have um, CMI's race network, which Pravita, you lead. Um, and there's again, links and networks, what they've done there. On our website, Mental Health First Aid England, you can find a lot of uh, resources um, and including the guidance I mentioned that we launched last week. Um, so I would just love to just on this note, thank you all for joining today, but specifically thank you to our panelists, Pavita Cooper, Sandra Kerr and Rafaela Ricardo. It was a really great um, discussion that we had and I hope people have taken away some really interesting food for thought, but also some things that they can also implement in the organization. If you have any questions, um, please do email us at workplace at mental health, first, um, mental health MHFA England .org. Um, But then um, again, nothing's left for me to say, but say thank you so much. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.